couple. We weren't to a married me, couple. We were the, definitely no, the odd couple. No, you're yeah, definitely yeah. the odd couple. Yeah. Yeah. We're neighbors. You're, yeah. you're Felix and uh, what's the other guy's name? Yeah. Oscar. 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 Yeah. 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 That and that and so who? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty clear on that. <laughs> I'm pretty clear. Uh, that's it. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to episode seven. Today we have special guest Star Trek director David Livingston. We'll be answering some more of your fan questions, doing some Star Trek trivia, and much more. My name is Erica LaRose, and for your hosts, Connor Trenier and Dominic Keating. Hey. Hi, hi, everybody. Hi, Erica. Hi, how you Erica, how are you? I'm great. So nice to be back in your house, Connor. Oh, Good God, it's been, delighted. It's been fantastic. <laughs> How's our uh, resident wash avocado uh, treelet? Oh, he is just doing lovely. I've kept him alive for the yeah. week. Thank yeah, you yeah. so much, by the way. I mean, well, feet. What, yeah. <laughs> what are you feeding him? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. This week, we are absolutely uh, chuffed, delighted, um, truly honoured yeah. uh, to have another really dignitary from the alum of Star Trek, dating all the way back to the next generation. Started life out as a line producer and uh, made it all the way to the hallowed halls of directorship. Um, he directed the episode that this whole show is based on, yeah. Shuttlepod 1. Yeah. He's an extraordinary uh, director and uh, and uh, human being, human being in general. <laughs> yeah. Um, our dear friend David Livingston, thank welcome aboard, so much, David. Yeah. Thank, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. It's really terrific. So, listen, it was not that long since we were all uh, doing a Zoom call for John Billingsley. Um, we know uh, you're associated with the Hollywood Food Coalition that we are going to be donating some of our proceeds to from this show. That's you're, terrific. You're still on board with that. That's still a. How did, yes. that, how did that come about? Um, at the end of 2019, uh, I had a couple of photographic exhibits on the homeless. The previous six months to that, starting in July of 2019, um, I started with uh, shooting the homeless in Los Angeles and Santa Monica and Hollywood. Was that, that, was, that was a pri- personal project? A personal just, project yeah, with from- my iPhone. And uh, it all started out where I was using my iPhone uh, to just do personal work. And when I'd go home at night and and upload all the pictures onto my computer, I found out that most of the photographs were about the homeless because it is so endemic to it is. to Los Angeles and and so heartbreaking, especially in Hollywood. I mean, especially, well, everywhere, but especially Hollywood and is, where you guys live in particular. Yeah. yeah, I mean, a mile away from me, there's a huge uh, yeah. homeless encampment, and I, I noticed that all the pictures, most of the pictures, were about the homeless, and it said something to me, and I said, I want to share these photographs uh, with the public. So uh, I decided to uh, have a photographic exhibit, and John Billings and I invited John Billingsley to see the exhibit, and he said, "Hey, David, I'm the president of this." Uh, oh, so uh, this was uh, completely. You didn't know that he was doing this. Not no. at all. He he got a hold of me and said, "I'm the president of the Hollywood Food Coalition uh, of the Board of Directors, and would you like me to partner with you on the exhibit?" So for the two exhibits, uh, I partnered with the Hollywood Food Coalition which um, uh, serves a homeless meal uh, every night to the homeless community of Hollywood, as well as doing a lot of other activities uh, related to uh, people uh, in need. And uh, subsequent to that, he asked me to join the board of directors, uh, which I did, and I'm still on the board and I'm very active. I also, uh, for a couple of years, shot their social media and stills for Instagram and, and, uh, and, and their website. So it's been very fulfilling and... Very. Uh, yeah, God bless you. Uh, and, and and how do you feel uh, your work has affected uh, the experience of people in Hollywood and uh, the homeless? I mean, have you do you feel as though you've had an impact? It certainly brought up uh, increased awareness. I had so many people come up to me during the exhibits, and they felt that I personalized uh, uh, what it was that, and it reflected what happened to me. I initially, when I started photographing them. Uh, felt very detached and imper- and it was very mm. impersonal to me. Mm. And as the months passed, as I shot more and more, I started getting in closer and closer and closer and until the later work was all right here. Did you... Extreme close-ups. Did you build a relationship with certain people on the street? I wouldn't say a relationship, but I did talk to them. 
and uh, to get Their in that close, to, I mean, to get to get that to close. get that close, you but had that, to have some trust with them. And yes, right. yes, and they yeah. had to know that I wasn't exploiting yeah. exploiting them. Um, sure. And and it and it then personalized it for me. And people who came to the exhibit had the same response. They said, "You seem to have gotten very close and and made it made it personal, and that it was no longer this kind of detached view of of this other group of people who weren't." really human to us right. and that's the whole thing one woman I, I, one woman broke my heart one night she's after i took her photographs and i gave her a couple of bucks as well and she says thank you thank you so much and i thought she was thanking me for the money mm. she said no mm. i'm thanking you for talking to me yeah. she said so many people just walk on by every day and never say a word and then what inspired you to do it it was in my face as i said when i was shooting with my iphone just my personal work it all ended up being right. about about the homeless. So it was something that I couldn't ignore. Right. And it kept drawing me in more and more. And I became I kept getting more and more involved. And I found out, hey, they're they're just as real people as yeah. as we are. Right. Uh, Is so, it uh, mostly under the, the bridge at Gower or Bunsen? No, I went I went everywhere. You went everywhere, uh, did you? The bridge under Gower is tough. That's yeah. that's not a place you really want to do much shooting no. because it's it's tough. But uh, I went all over. I did a lot of work in Santa Monica. Did you? Um, and, and the Hollywood area. Oh, bless you, David. I tell you. It's, yeah. Uh, uh, it, was, it was very gratifying. It was gratifying to see people uh, respond to it. Well, uh, let's just take a little slight turn and go back in time a little bit to uh, how you first got involved with Star Trek itself. And, uh, you, and you came on board Next Generation as a line producer. Were you a line producer prior to that? On other I have to TV correct shows? you. Oh. I, I came on please, board please. as a production manager. Ah. Um, for those who don't know, there's a cla two classifications of the crew and behind the cameras. It's above the line and below the line. Right. Above the line are all the big mucky mucks, the producers, right, the right. writers, the actors, uh, the people that that run that run the that are the that was oh, us. Let me let yeah. me let me rephrase that. The ones that are really well paid. <laughs> um, I was the production manager uh, on the pilot for the Next Generation, and that's a below the line function. Right. Uh, my responsibility is to hire the crew, do the budgets, and then to supervise uh, the production. And how did you get to that point? I was working at Hollywood uh, at uh, ABC Circle Films. Uh, doing movies of the week for them. And uh, Michael Schoenbrunn, who was the uh, head of television uh, physical production at Paramount, uh, called my boss at ABC Circle and said, I'm looking for a production manager for this pilot that I'm doing. And my boss, Sally Young, uh, recommended me. And I went over and interviewed and, and got the job. Did you have any particular affinity for Star Trek up, up until that point? Had you watched it as a a younger no. man and not especially no no i uh i was a man from uncle fan when i, when I was in high <laughs> Me school too. Right? Uh, yeah. and i knew but i did i did watch some of the features uh i did like the original uh star trek movie the robert wise uh right. which i thought was terrific right. and i liked the one where uh where they come back to uh come back to the u.s in back in time that's right they come back that, in time so but they I, all came up they all came before the fact of next gen i sometimes that's correct. forget that of course right. it was all after george lucas's success with star wars yeah that everybody that, sorry sorry for saying that in front of <laughs> no no no. <laughs> but that that was the, the, the headless chicken moment in all the studios like what are we going to do in response to this star wars thing and uh some young turk at the paramount meeting went well don't we own something like that and that's when they went knocking on gene roddenberry's door and so, so you met the great man, I take it. At I did some meet. Point. Yeah. I did meet the great man. Uh, I only had a, a, a couple of uh, interactions with him, but uh, he set the stage for us all. He had this vision of of humanity coming out on the uh, positive end end of things, and uh, uh, this is a testament of of how that original premise uh, still holds sway today. It's it's an extraordinary, isn't it? extraordinary uh, thing that he he launched for all of us yeah. truly is it's a phenomenon and i've been watching our show religiously in the last i don't know two months since we started this uh endeavor and it's it, i have to say it's truly seeped into my bones and um i'm i've become a star trek fan and where, where i might not have said that in past years but i i truly get the i i get the the ethos and the uh whatever that frankly, that drug is that, that the fans love, it's starting to seep into my uh, being. And I, I'm really, I'm loving it. And uh, you see, you start to really grasp a, 
the, the, the thematic uh, through line in all the episodes and uh, and all the sort of areas of humanity that it touches on. It's but, quite a remar- remarkable thing. It is. And, but, but your role was different. Your job, um, at least by the time you got to us, for us, was that you were determining whether or not um, uh, the uh, budget was appropriate yeah. for uh, a crane shot or... You know, there, there, I, I did hear stories prior to directing our show that, you know, oh, there were stories. Some, somebody would come in and be like, <laughs> hey, what I'd love to, as a director, I'd love to have like a crane come down. And you'd be like, no, no, not good in the budget. <laughs> Can't do it. No, not happening. And then when it came to your episodes, <laughs> you, they're two different jobs. <laughs> they, are. they are. And you have to be faithful uh, to each job. If right. you try and color the one job with the other, you're going to fail. Right. Right. So yeah, fair I, enough. I couldn't do that. Um, yeah, my job as a production manager and then as a line producer, producer, and finally supervising producer. Different uh, hats. Different hats. Yeah. Literally, I have to turn, I wear a baseball cap all the time and you just had to turn it around for the other job. Who were you fighting on our show? Was it Brad Yacobian who, or Mary Howard? Who, 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 who was the all battle with? <laughs> Those are them. <laughs> Those are them. <laughs> but so, having, having said that, you know, having, having been on the other side and then going into directing... Um, did you know the battles you were going to have? Did Absolutely. You know? I knew you better than anybody you did. what the issues were. Right. And I knew better about scheduling. I knew better. I, right. I, I'm not trying to be no. prideful no. or boastful, but I knew as a director that I could do one shot before lunch and I was still going to make the day where the studio and the production department mm. were going insane, saying, what are you doing, David? You're killing us. Right. But I, I knew, based upon my experience from right. that other side, what I could do. Um, and uh, do, were you, I mean, okay, so in all those 15 episodes or so that you directed of our uh, uh, show, uh, Enterprise, did you generally make your day pretty much? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'd go a half hour or an hour yeah, over. Yeah, but that's not but horrible. That's, that's, that's nothing. That, that isn't. Peanuts. Yeah. Now, so why I, did I, I, became be- more, I became more efficient. Uh, when I first started off, I went over a lot. But, uh, I, and also um, having multiple, uh, be able to use multiple cameras on, on uh, Enterprise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it helped a lot. To, and not to having be able to, to reload facilitate. the mag once we went to the exactly. digital. Digital yeah. became you don't, you a don't whole have, different thing. When, how many hours of production are lost Spent. when you have to check the gate? Yes. I mean, yeah. I was, I'm wondering, like, so, you know, you got to our show, and I think on season two, we got digital. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. correct. Right? Yeah. And huge, the, huge change. Huge difference. Uh, and in terms of the look, it's unbelievably yeah. better. And also Suited from our show. A per, huh? Suited our show. It's absolutely. And... And the efficiency for being able to direct, because a mag is a thousand feet and it's 10 minutes. If you get close to the end of it and the actors are on a roll right. and you want to just do one more, yeah. you can't because they got to yeah. reload. But shooting digitally, I could say, don't cut, yeah. keep going, go back again. to one, yeah. go right. back, put the yeah. camera over there and let's do it again because you guys are on a roll. Yeah, exactly. And that, that was a gift to me as a director. Mm. And also to be able to see everything in HD on monitors, yeah. um, so you never questioned in your mind what you were uh, getting. What you were, what you were getting. Yeah. Well, I had such a luxury working with you that I had that same thing. That like you know, I'm like, don't stop, don't stop, just I'll do it again. Yeah, I'll, I'll go again. Don't yeah. don't don't cut. Don't yeah, cut. I mean, if you're if you're on a roll, I remember. Yeah. But <laughs> the momentum, the momentum, and the energy when you cut, it just you can feel the air go out of a room. Yeah, and you don't want to let that go. No. You know, no. that you was know. the Sony Red, wasn't it? Yeah, good camera. And yeah, it, uh, was, but it shot really well in low light, which is was a lot of our show. That sort of submarine feel. We were talking about this before we came on camera. Yeah, about that sort of slightly enclosed space, uh, like the ready room and the captain's ready room, and it was uh, it was particularly sh- it shot well with our film with our with our show. Absolutely. Well, uh, one thing we want to get back to in particular the episode we did together. Yes, Shuttle Shuttle Pod Pod 1. But prior to that, we want to go to uh, fan questions, I believe. Oh, great. You guys ready for some fan questions? Go on, then. (laughs) First, we have one from Kimberly Mortensen. She asked, why did they slightly change the theme song in season three? (laughs) And was anyone upset by the change? Because I was. Ha ha. I know the reason. I do you? believe, yeah, I do. I think so, yeah. Um, I, I didn't know they changed. I'll tell you why. Well, yeah. they started putting a tambourine beat in the theme song to yeah. jingle it up a bit. 
to make it go <laughs> to make it sound a bit more poppy. I mean, one of the I don't know when we have Mr. Berman on. I want to ask him this. One of the notes apparently that came through was, "Could we put a, a boy band in the mess hall scenes?" I know. I'm not kidding. I believe this is a true story. <laughs> yeah, to, to 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 amp up the show and get a younger. So there you go. Um, well, also there's also a thing that uh, in, in our first year, at least maybe the first two years, it was not called Star Trek Enterprise. No, it, it was, was just called Enterprise. Enterprise. They were trying to drop big, big the, mistake. Uh, yeah, huge. Well, mistake. they were trying to not pay the Roddenberry Foundation or whatever you want to call it. They were trying to disassociate themselves at that point. Yeah, I mean, when you look back now and see how we were right at the cusp of TV changing. Yeah, mm, you know, yeah. it really was. And, well, I also uh, remember um, um, hearing that um, around season three or four, that um, the, the, the fact that we were being DVR'd, recorded, because you couldn't see our show. So, for instance, if you saw our show um, in L.A. on a Thursday at nine o'clock, well, and if you were in St. Louis and there was a baseball game, yeah, the car got bumped. We got bumped. Yeah, we got so, bumped for Friday night football in Texas. I mean, no kidding. I mean, it was it was tough. The, anyway. the uh, second question is it a, was really tough, people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to say something about this. I wanted to ask yeah. you guys about the song, yeah. Yeah. theme song. Oh, I thought. <coughs> I love Diane Warren. She's mm. a brilliant songwriter. She's up for another Oscar this year. Yeah, 13 she's, in she's a row. She's brilliant. But yeah. that, that song was an old song that was used, what, a decade earlier. Wasn't it? And yeah, it, it wasn't original for it. And it was absolutely r- wrong for a Star Trek show. I, when I first heard it, I said, what is this? Did, <laughs> did you guys like it? I mean, where was the, where was the drive? Where Honestly, was the exploration? You it didn't was, think it was, it was the mel- images? No, it no. was melodramatic Honestly, and I, like, oh, God. I, I, I will say this. I think for, I'll speak for myself, that um, when we came into the show, um, we thought we were doing well, a prequel, one, mm. and that we were doing something different. Mm. They had taken Star Trek as the term out of our show and we're just enterprise and i and i thought you know you know uh, it, it sort of made sense um but there were so many i don't know a thousand different executives involved in that decision that i never had a problem with it it was the least uh, i mean honestly i was delighted to have finally got series regular right on exactly. an american <laughs> tv yeah, show true. we had <laughs> the least of my issues was the bloody song <laughs> no <laughs> we, we had we had a trailer near uh, you know stage 19 yeah really yeah uh, let, me, uh, let me put it in context. Though. Okay. I'll relate it to the first day I shot on the show. The, uh, the line producer came to me and she told me, she said, now, David, because she knew, she knew that I would push the envelope on stuff and, and wanted to take no prisoners. And she told me, now, David, this is a, a more gentler, easier going Star Trek show. That we're not going to have as many stunts and action. And I said to myself, what are these people thinking? How 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 can you possibly present that to an audience? I mean, you, you got who are you competing with? Right, look, right. look what's out on the horizon. Right. Look where television is 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 going right now. And to me, it didn't make sense. Well, I and think, I, I think that I think that was a fundamental problem with the show. I think ultimately, um, what you just said is very key in that um, they were operating on an antiquated sensibility of what uh, our show was meant to be and and the the series and the franchise was meant, was meant to be. I am su- surprised to hear you say that, that that was a note that came down uh, from the top. Uh, I, I remember rem- we were shooting at Disney, the ranch, the Disney ranch, and I, I remember the conversation vividly and I, I was in shock. I mean, how... I, yeah, no, it, 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 it didn't. It didn't make me. sense to me. I, Jerry Goldsmith. I mean, these great composers yeah. would oh. would have these monumental epic uh, theme songs. You know, I, I was first, always, the first call I would have made was would be to John Williams and say, "Come on, John, come on, do right. it, do yeah. do what you did for Star Wars, do it for Star right. Trek." Now, well, I mean, that's what you, I would have done. When you think that they spent, I mean, was it nine or ten million dollars on those two pilot episodes? Uh, money was not an issue, apparently. Uh, no, it's, and, and uh, I had always heard that there was a backroom deal uh, uh, concerned with that song. Again, uh, that's I, as much as I, I know. It just made no, no sense to recycle yeah. an old song that was used in a movie yeah. years before that. I it's. 
Anyway, good luck, Miss Warren. Five yeah. times this yeah, is no, she's, she's up for an Oscar in five I years. You win. Yeah. I, I, I've <laughs> not going to win. <laughs> I've been able to speak to her on occasion, and she's terrific. She's. Uh, we have uh, one more, which is a three part for you, David. Uh, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Eve England emailed us from Wales. Ooh. She says, uh, you have directed some of the best Trek episodes, many you have directed for the franchise. Which episodes did you have the most fun directing? Were there any particular... Be careful now. Yeah. Shuttle pod <laughs> one. <laughs> Just want to say. <laughs> were there any particular episodes that were more challenging? And did you find the experience of directing across various Trek shows different in any notable way? You know, easy peasy, David. <laughs> Well, let's break it up. Yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> Which ones did you have the most fun directing? When I wasn't uh, on the ship, uh, when we would go to an alternate reality or go to a planet. Oh, cool. um, my favorite uh, Enterprise show was in, uh, Impulse in terms of directing. Mm. Uh, because it wasn't a Star Trek show, it was, an, it was a zombie show. Yes. Uh, where yep. the Vulcans become infected yep. and... and uh, I, I, I looked at it when I was shooting it. I said, I'm doing a horror movie, and that's, that's how I have to look at this every shot. Um, Herman Zimmerman, the production designer, elevated uh, the Vulcan set where all the Vulcans had become zombies so that we could light it up, uh, light everything from the bottom. So it was the traditional thing of where kids hold a flashlight uh, under their chin at Halloween with the mask on mm. so they look, oh. they look uh, like monsters right and that's exactly how we uh, approached the episode and everything on in that episode was was geared to doing a horror movie um i did uh, alternate reality shows on deep space nine um and those were always great because the care the the principal cast got to play characters uh that that were that were different than their mm -hmm. usual characters and that was always fun to see them chewing the scenery and and uh, pl playing outside their comfort zone as their original characters. So I always enjoyed the, the, um, those episodes particularly. Very cool. Did you did you not like shooting on the sets, the the, the standing sets particularly, or did no, you, no, you no, I there. Not unless there was action. Right. Uh, Rick always told me he said you just want to wreck something, <laughs> and that's <laughs> that's kind of the thing I had, and yet my most emotionally satisfying episodes were the ones where people just talked. Um, uh, the Visitor is probably uh, one of my favorites. And I got to tell you, I watched your guys episode yesterday and I was blown away uh, on how emotionally affected I was by it oh, and I the relationship. I know you're going to talk about it, but um, I hadn't seen it in 20 years. And uh, it was really a, when you're in the, when you're in the process, it's it, it's just it's work, and you don't really um, you you want to make sure you're trying to deliver the emotional content of this of the show, mm. but it's an intellectual process, and you don't really uh, emotionally connect with everything uh, in its entirety. So when I saw the episode again 20 years later, right. it finally affected me. Right. And I said, whoa, this is really good. It is I, moving. I, I, am, I, am moved, yeah. I am moved by this. And I never, and that's what's been so delightful about revisiting all of these episodes. I'm watching them again and saying, we really did good work. We did. And, yeah. and yeah. when you're in the middle of it, you don't, you don't at least I didn't, I didn't get that. So I'm very. Well, you know, it's also interesting. I think that you know I, I can back up from my own experience on Enterprise, uh, working with directors, and sometimes there were directors who were just kind of like, "Hey, man, you know, uh, Marvin, do your thing, and we'll come in and do that stuff." And there were directors who were super specific about uh, maybe coming from like an editing background, mm. who didn't need you to do um, much more than they had for that particular shot. Yes. David, honest to God, you gave us, me, Dominic, the luxury of telling the story and telling the story with a camera and the craft of that. Yeah. And that was a remarkable experience. And, and it wasn't often that we ever got that. There were some, uh, you know, filming difficulties when they decided they, were, they wanted to see our breath. 
uh, and suddenly, you know, it became all the, because this was the, the bottle show where, you know, it was meant to be a, a money saver. We got to the end of the first season and all of a sudden they'd like, oh, we need to save some money it's here. Yeah. And they'd stick them in a bottle and shoot it. And, uh, and it became much more than that. Um, but I remember, yeah, so then they got the, the air conditioning units in, the dry ice. You had the good thought to split that shuttle pod in half. I remember we came back, was it from one lunch? Yeah. Um, and you ch- chopped it in half. <laughs> Herman Zimmerman, bless his heart. I've known, I used to work with Herman prior to- He's a great even man, on wasn't the, he? Even on The Next Generation. He was our production designer. Yeah. Production designer. Yeah. And, and uh, he built sets to stay. I mean, you, yeah. you could really fly that. You could in. really fly that shuttle. Right. But the, the thing was, uh, it had a steel superstructure. And uh, I, I couldn't get the camera to where I needed to get the camera to be able to, sh- to shoot the show. So one day uh, at lunch, I called uh, Herman down and Louise Dorton, who was the uh, uh, his assistant, and I said, uh, "I need you to cut the set in half." And Herman, how did that go down? And Herman said, <laughs> "Herman said, it's all steel, David. I don't know how we can do that." And I said, "Herman, can you just just please find out?" And he says, "Okay, I'll ask." Don't Tom. tell Brad. Yeah, d- don't yeah, exactly. Don't yeah. tell Brad. Yeah, this was all on the QT. Uh-huh. So uh, he said, "Well, let me ask Tom Arp, who was a construction coordinator." And they called Tom down from the uh, from the office, and he looked at it and he says, "I can do that." And it literally at lunch, oh, they got out all their saws and they sawed that puppy in half. Oh my God! And and it allowed me to put the camera to where I needed to put the camera. You got some beautiful intimate shots. Well, with the that. thing about intimacy is what it's about yeah. because my thing with that show was claustrophobia. Yeah. I said to myself, I have to have the audience feel that they're trapped as-, as we're, we're in the bottle. Yeah, right. literally, yeah. That, you're, and, and that you're trapped. Did you have any control over um, the stories that you told? None. None. So no, no, no. no. You, you epi- episodic directors, mm. uh, they're the flavor of the month or the flavor of the week. And that show in particular, they were rigorous about what they'd written. And but you never Star had Trek. any any latitude to 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 decide or write a script that you presented to. Uh, I probably wrote fifty story ideas Did that I really? presented. Didn't I read I, in the in our notes from for you coming on today that you'd come up you'd come up with a story for Troy and uh, you had a Godfather or something. Script. No, well, there was a, there was a there was a there was a shuttle pod episode in Next Gen. I sold two I sold two uh, uh, stories, and one was rather like this. One was the Nagus, uh, which was produced. In right? the entire time you worked for Star Trek, yeah. you sold two stories. That's it. Oh. I'm not a writer, <laughs> but, it, but but I did I did sell a couple. I mean, it's, well, look, I tried. We all tried. Let's see. Of he, course, we all he said and that, that, and it was so he said like, like a chastising father, didn't he? <laughs> 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 no, it was very. It was very generous that they would even read them because I'm not a writer. Uh, but but cool. uh, but you did come up with this idea of the shu- of a of a sh- of two two characters mm-hmm. stuck in a shuttle pod. One yeah one right. one that I proposed for the next generation was having uh, uh, Mrs. Troy and uh, Data trapped inside a shuttle and having to work together to survive right. and to solve whatever mm-hmm. problems. I don't even remember what what the plot was. Um, but t- talking about two disparate personalities and who who did not like each other. I mean, I don't know if Data would say that he didn't like her, but but she certainly didn't like having to be stuck inside a right. shuttle with with a robot. Right. And when I got your guys' episode, I said, "Wait a minute, I I know this episode. We I, were, I I know. I think I know what to do with this. I kind of understand." What it is. Right. So we weren't a married me, couple. We were the, definitely no, the odd couple. No, you're yeah. definitely yeah. the odd couple. Yeah. Yeah. We're neighbors. You're, yeah. you're Felix and uh, what's the other guy's name? Yeah. Oscar. 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 Yeah. 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 That and that and so who's who? I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty clear on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty clear. Uh, that's it. I'm out of here. Exactly. <laughs> who has a cigar? It's, um, it's okay, Jack. <laughs> yeah, but going back to the the constrictions of that and uh, and and Connor's thought about you being a wonderful director to let us just you know fly with it, but there were restrictions. I mean when they were got obsessed with this breath thing, all of a sudden we were shooting in 20 second increments because- I, I felt horrible It was that. tough going. I, I mean, did you? I, I mean, thought it was- Why? Because of the restrictions it put on you guys. I, every time that I <clears throat> interrupted or said something about the breath, I went, oh my God, the, they're going to be so pissed. And I- You should is, know something about this. I just this. thought that was just We awful. sucked You it should up. know something about this. 
Dominic and I spent... 10 days. 10 days at we least. We got those and, scripts and, early. And, and we learned the lines and we turned this into a two-hander play. And when we got to you, we knew exactly what we're going to do. Yeah. And so anything thrown to us didn't matter. We no, knew, we could we dance. Were, we, were we, 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 were, we were ready to dance. And... Yeah. Uh, and I, we, and I, I remember fighting you about one thing, David. And I, having seen the episode myself recently, I wonder whether you weren't right. I don't know how drunk we got. I wonder whether we could have been less drunk. I could we, have been we, less we, drunk. We, we got, no, oh, you, you like can, drunk? You like the oh, drunk? That was that was unbelievable. You had to go that far. Well, God bless you for why, saying why that. Why would you? I don't know. I remember you saying to me on the set that day. You know, do you want to tone the drunk down? And I said, well, <laughs> but look, we've I drunk. I said that. You did say that. That was idiocy on my part. <laughs> you were a TV director at a certain time in TV direction. And I look at it now, and maybe I was looking at it with a TV. I like that. I'm you're that the, you're film drunk. You're not TV drunk. Do you know what I'm saying when I'm well, saying that? I w- Boy, if I said oh, that, I, I should be. Oh, you did. You did. Look, look, by the way, I, we had, we literally went through everything going on that week together with the, the six, um, Six air conditioning six, units, yeah, and, the dry and, ice, and, and, and the whole. And it was of the hardcore, whole man. The noise of those air conditioning units, and we were didn't but they'd locked off about a quarter of stage nine. It was it was pretty f-ing intense. Yeah, right? we yeah. we had the stage cold, and then we enclosed everybody was the shuttle freezing itself there. as as an even. And we worked. It was so, like a it was like a refrigerator, and then we were in the freezer. In the fridge, and we worked yes, so hard in the to freezer get, of the like, fridge. Our breaths to come okay, out. Well, th- this is what I've always wanted to ask you guys. Yeah. Would you today? This wouldn't have happened because digitally we could have put yeah. in breath so easily. Back then it was for, too expensive. For nothing. Yes. Yeah. Then, Back then it wouldn't there was be, a lot and, of money. And there, and there wasn't the technology to be able to no. to create that. Like water couldn't be done at that point. Right. And, and then look what yes. James Cameron yes. did. And, and I've always wanted to ask you, did it help your performances to 100%. be in that situation? 100%. I think so. I think the intensity of the shoot. Uh, I'm talking about the cold. Oh, and the cold did certainly, it, it did not hurt. By the way, what, we, cold. what we've done, I think we've talked about this before, is that we dry ice packed in underneath the set. Um, the set itself was uh, visqueened off and it was very, very cold. We had, you know, jackets on. We had a hot tea to drink yeah. uh, in between scenes. In between, uh, and I, I will in say between this. St- I mean, literally, in between, between s- shots. shots. And, and, and so you bring in the tea and you yeah. drink and then... We were peeing like, uh, yeah. I, I, I like, like drunkards. I, I will say that it was the only time I've ever had an opportunity to kind of like go, yeah, this is what it's like. Well, an yeah. actor has to deal with the given circumstances, yes, right? Yes, This was an episode where they were the real given circumstances. Yes, exactly. But, but, I, but I'm wondering, as an actor... Was it beneficial? And what I'm hearing is, yeah, you can oh, use yes. that. Definitely. It was beneficial because of the work we'd done prior to this. Yeah, we that was amazing. Ex- we knew exactly I think what we were doing together on screen. If we'd been learning the, the lines that morning in the uh, trailer or in the makeup t- chair, it, it would have been pretty ghastly. Different. That's, that's yeah. cool. it's great to hear that. Yeah. But I get that because you were so prepared, yeah. whatever we threw at you, no, exactly. you could it do it. Matter. And you, yeah. So, yeah. so it wasn't an imposition. It was actually no, it was, a, it was a bene- of, beneficial. Yes, part of the process. Indeed. Okay, yeah. great. That's and great I to the, hear. I remember the crew, everyone just getting behind this particular episode. I have vivid memories of Jerry Fleck, who was the first AD, being, you know, I could see him just being excited by what we were doing. It, we we kind of knew we were doing something everyone was slightly knew, everyone above knew and beyond. Everyone knew you and I were set to go. Yeah. And whatever happened, happened. Yeah. Yeah, some in episodic television. Uh, as an episodic director, it's the luck of the draw. You got luck. You lucked out with a couple of good I, ones, I didn't did. you? <laughs> but in this episode, it was one of those episodes where everybody, once they saw the script, had to rise to the occasion. I have great respect for you guys doing all that preparatory work because that made my and I didn't realize that, but that made my life infinitely. Easier yes. than what you, you guys did. didn't have to go up and ask for lines and, because there were a lot of long takes oh, yeah. and it was all it was dialogue wall to wall. Yeah. So so every department rose to the occasion and realized they're doing something special in in very difficult circumstances. I'm not saying we're like shooting in, no. the, in you know in Alaska in a, in a snowstorm, but it was it no, was it, difficult. And what it you was didn't difficult, know, David. It was. was that Dom and I realized we were doing a two hander, yeah. which is a theater. 
peace, you know. It's a peace. And we knew, and we come from that background mm -hmm. and, uh, and we, we respected it such. And, and luckily, it was the one time we got that script a week and a half before. I mean, I, and God bless Rick for that and Brandon because they, they, they made sure we got that. And, I went uh, to your house. And I, your I, 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 in, I had him come Beachwood around to my Canyon. little apartment in Beachwood Canyon, which I literally can throw from back in those days, <laughs> a bag of weed with a stone in it from, from that apartment to your house. I can still do it over the canyon to his house from my place now, uh, the house that Chuck built. But um, we sat in that apartment on every free moment we had. <laughs> for hours. For hours. I, I, hours. I, yeah. Undying respect for that. I had one other experience uh, with that myself was on uh, when I did The Visitor, which was another... Uh, show with that uh, profound emotional content. And Ira said, to, when I got the script, Ira Bear, who was the executive mm -hmm. producer and showrunner, said uh, to me, are you going to rehearse? And I said, episodic director, rehearse? I don't know. That. So um, uh, Tony Todd and Rachel Robinson, uh, who were in the episode, actually came to my house and we rehearsed in front of my fireplace. And then- On we, Beachwood? Uh, uh, no, this was, another, place. This was right. in West LA. Right. And-, and we literally took that same setup and put it in front of Did a you? fireplace on stage yeah, and it made all the difference in the world it to really the actors. Does. So I can, uh, again, uh, that mirrors what yeah. you guys were telling me. So again, I, I didn't know you did that. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think because that, you know, one of the things that uh, you don't get in episodic television is the luxury of recognizing the role that you're playing as a storyteller because you're just trying to, manage nine pages that day yeah mm -hmm. so which is a lot <laughs> which is a lot you know you yeah. go home that night and have to learn nine pages which is a, a great deal but you know there are occasions where like this shuttlepod one where you get to do something that you know look at the end of the day i did that show and that show mattered mm. there you go uh, let me ask you about becoming a director because it was something i wanted to do and i spent hours in the edit suite how did you make that jump from uh, being a producer to becoming a director? Did you shadow some directors? And I mean, when did Rick say, okay, I think you could do this? I went to SC film school ah. and always wanted to direct, but I was always petrified to do it. Um, but Rick one day, uh, Rick had this thing called the DIT school, which yeah. is called director yeah. and training. Yeah, and, I did it. And, yeah. Same and, here. and Jonathan yeah. uh, was the first graduate and yeah. certainly his career has proven yeah. uh, the worth of that. And Rick asked me one day if I wanted to direct. He actually offered it to me. I didn't ask him. Um, what was that about then? Well, what, he, what did he, he see? That, uh, um, in dailies, uh, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. You would comment. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, he thought with my mouth that, uh, can I put my mouth in action? So uh, I think he, Rick was good at that, wasn't he? He was very good at he was noticing very, who was gonna, who would, who could help him out. Also, very extraordinarily generous. And yeah, and so he offered me that, and I went to did school for about six months. Right. I also went into therapy because fear was my was huge. Yeah, I hear that. I, mate. I, I had uh, nightmares about being on the set and literally not knowing where to put the camera, and. How do you make that first choice about what, does it camera go from here to there or stay here and go there? I, I don't know, yeah. yeah. Which is uh, the right choice, yeah. How much did you rely on Marvin, uh, who you, you brought Marvin on. Marvin Rush was yeah, our I DP. Hired, I hired Marvin in the third year of uh, The Next Generation. Right. Marvin and I, uh, we had a love. Yeah. An interesting relationship. relationship. We did, yeah. we did. But, but Marvin graciously has always said you made it really hard on me but um the work always proved to be worthwhile nice. and from marvin that was high praise for me huge um david and dominic are you ready for star trek trivia no. which is um david's erica puckering will, up i can see I it yeah, he's, he's like, <laughs> it's a fun <laughs> segment david <laughs> um erica will tell us the rules and we will go forward from there all right miss erica yes so star trek trivia is a three of you against producer mark oh god it's um mostly multiple choice if you guys get a question wrong mark has the opportunity to answer it if Mark gets a question wrong, you guys do not because it's three of you against him. New rules. Right. We've got to commiserate here. So, right. New rules stacked again <laughs> yeah. in his favor. 
It was just one solo man over uh, there. I tell you. Boo. <laughs> Boo. A man with a uh, checkbook uh, make, so, uh, making got- this up as he goes along. <laughs> Honestly, he is he's rigorous about winning. He just <laughs> I'm like, it's meant to be fun. He's coming up with more creative right. ways every day to win. Question number one. Is it to me? <laughs> yes, it's to Dominic, and then we'll go around. Um, all right, Dominic, what does MAKO stand for? A, Military Achievable Command Operatives. Ooh. B, Military Analyzing Command Operatives. C, Military Assassin Command Operations. Or D, Military Assault Command Operations. I've got to go with... I, it's got to be D. It is D. Oh, yes. yes. No. How, yes. Nice. How could you oh, cause They were my guys. I mean, well come done. on. Well done. Did you really know that? Well, the other ones seemed improbable. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the power of deduction. I, uh, I have to say, I mean, it was like, oh, Mako, I should know this. They were my guys. Um, sort of. It's true. Yeah. They were Steve Culp's guys. But, um, anyway, on to David. On to David. In the Voyager episode, Worst Case Scenario, who was the original author of the Hollow novel? It's either A, Tom Paris, B, Seska, C, Captain Janeway, or D, Tuvok. Tom Paris. Mark. Mark. Oh, God. Tuvok. Mark gets a point. What was the <laughs> hollow novel? No, though, to be fair to David, um, he's partially right, because in the episode, nobody knows who wrote the program, and Tom volunteers to to finish it because it was an incomplete... Well, I think that's half a point yeah. each then. Yeah, Mark came <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> well, half, half points. You see what I mean? I don't know about your half point. <laughs> <laughs> David, you've inspired us to do half points. I'll take it. <laughs> all right, David Con- said anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Connor, what is Starfleet's prime directive? A, diplomacy and nonviolence. B, non-intervention. C, providing assistance to those in need, or D, exploration and scientific study. <laughs> so, uh, Dom, Just say it. Dom has given me a, a very satable uh, B. Yes, you yes! are correct. Yes! Nice. Look at us. Look at the team. <laughs> ah, I feel good. I feel yeah. good. I feel yeah. good All about right. this. All that Star Trek watching, it pays <laughs> off, I'll tell you. <laughs> Producer. Uh, them a week. Uh, you're on the crew. Look at me. Producer Mark, you're next. I'll be sending in my questions soon enough. Let me tell you. <laughs> I got a couple of questions for you, Mr. Trenier. <laughs> All right. Uh, is it back to me or is it Mark's? It's Mark. Mark's, Mark's question. question. All right. Mark's hand is raised already. already. <laughs> Such an ass. <laughs> you're awful. Question number four is for you, Mark. In the Voyager episode, Unimatrix Zero, the Borg Queen shook up one of the crew members with this cryptic remark. What did she say? A, really, Seven, you know what you are. B, I don't need drones to assimilate you, Tuvok. C, see you soon, Harry. Or D, I can help you, Captain. You are in a Borg space now. See you soon, Harry. I think it's C. Yes. Ah, boo. Well well done. (laughs) Okay. It's line. Oh, I, it's, I tell you, I, I go with it's a, what's a good line? I'll see you. I think, so, uh, uh, that was, so that's where I, that's where that one came from. Just uh, what's just a good a, line? Who would write that? Round round one is a tie. Star okay, Trek no alum kidding. versus okay. producer Mark. Right. So, oh. I'm so excited right now. Question number five: What is the purpose of the Vulcan ritual of Kolinar? A, a purging of emotion. B, the temporary union of two minds. C, sexual release and mating, or D, the transfer of one's consciousness into the body of another. Ooh, I think it's, God, honestly, all these rituals all sound a bit the same, don't they? I mean, (laughs) colon R with a C or K, I think it's. With a K, with a K. With a K. Yes. It's either A or B. I think, let's go with, I'm going to go B. Uh, wrong. It's A. Mark, Nuts. Mark, Mark. Mark. Uh, purging of emotion. Correct. It's A. It was A. Bugger. Uh, Bugger. I'm you guys gonna, are still doing great. Yeah, you're doing good. <laughs> oh, we're doing great. I knew it was... <laughs> Ma- mathematically, David, you're still David, in this. David, 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 question number six is for you. Before Deep Space Nine, Avery Brooks played a character on which show? Oh, come on. Spencer for Hire. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, right... <laughs> I didn't even have to F5. finish. I love that. <laughs> and he was great. <laughs> he was great. Dear Connor, question number seven is for you. 
Hikaru Sulu held which position for the longest period of time aboard the USS Enterprise NCC 1701 A? A. Helmsman. B. Chief Engineer. C. Science Officer. Or D. Communications Officer. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. It's A, right? Yeah. Absolutely. A. Totally. A. Got it. Nice job. Yeah. Oh. Good job. <laughs> Producer Mark. What is the name of the pilot that Kess is fond of in the Voyager episode, Darkly? A, Zahir, B, Byron, C, Nakan, or D, Gandhi? <laughs> oh, you poor thing, Mark, you poor thing. A. Oh, that is correct, ah, Mark. Oh. Damn. Ah. <laughs> That's the only one that wasn't good. Can't beat this guy. Um, are we in He's a tie? Good. We are in a tie. It okay. is uh, four to four. We got a oh, sudden death. So we now. have a sudden Boy. death now. All right. All right. In the season two premiere of Enterprise, what century was Archer stranded in? Oh. Mark, what is that? A, twentieth. B, thirty-first. C, twenty-ninth. Or D, sixth. Thirty-first. You are correct. Yes. Oh, wow. oh yes. Oh yes. You Bring it on. on. Right. <laughs> If I could get up and run around my house right now, I would do that. <laughs> but you can't. I can't. I'm I'm sorry, I have set on. <laughs> I've got wires on me. I would run around my house right now, and I would. How's that feel? Save this feeling for later. I'm very, do very it. proud of. I'm, I'm very proud of you boys. You, you uh-huh. you're all grown up. Come on, you, you babies, y'all grow up. Babies, y'all grow up. A moment of hesitation. Good job, yeah. you guys. Great. There you go. Well, thanks, Erica, uh, for Star Trek trivia. That is a legitimate win. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's a pleasure. Star Trek. I mean, so Mark is, that uh, down. Mark is seething. Watch out, Mark. There Mark is a, left the building. There's a new Star Trek yeah. sheriff coming to town, honey. <laughs> um, so um, we have a new segment. Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, another question coming in in the shape of a video uh, format. And uh, this is from Nicholas Lauder. God bless him. And we're just going to listen to the question now, and then we'll answer it. Hello, my name is Nicholas Lauder, captain of the USS Sizzle Rail. By the time I got to college is when Enterprise came out. Season 3 took a definitive turn when they decided to make a whole season story arc. But the fourth season seemed a little rushed. Each one of those mini story arcs within season 4 seemed to be good enough material for a whole season of their own. The Romulans, Klingons, Terra Prime with the kind of speciesism. Why did the show come to an end? I thought Enterprise was just getting going. Thanks for taking my question, and I hope you all live long and prosper. All right, thanks, Nicholas. So, uh, yes. What is your feeling on why we ended? First of all, I the show... Uh, they were told they were going to end uh, after season three. So season four, everyone knew the writing was on the wall. Uh, I have never heard that before. Same here. That's the you first time. Heard no, that. I've never no. heard that, that, that it was that, that close to, to that, ending in season three. That was my that was my understanding that that we were wow. on the cusp. Um, well, there's the season it, four then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just do that. The Love different that. Star Trek shows had different. Uh, uh, control mechanisms behind it. Uh, the next generation was syndicated, so it had no network involvement, uh, which gave it the freedom to do whatever it wanted to do and and was bankrolled exclusively by Paramount and didn't have to answer to any other right. any other chiefs. Sure. Or chefs rather. Right. Uh, when Enterprise happened, there was UPN and Whenever but you, also, yeah. pre-UPN or pre-Enterprise was Voyager on UPN. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. But ours yeah. was definitely a flagship show for that new network, right. as it were. And right. that was, you know, a, a blessing and then sadly not. So. A curse. First of all, when you get a network involved in anything, uh, it can muddle the message and yeah. it can muddle uh, the drama. Uh, the Star Trek... Rick Berman and the, and the writing staff of all the different series knew what they were doing, and the proof was in the pudding that there were seven, uh, three shows uh, that went seven years each. Mm-hmm. And they should have let them alone. But I also think there was a fundamental problem with Enterprise in that they were trying to mix it up too much and that uh, eliminating the name Star Trek from the... Uh, from the name of the series initially was a mistake. 
look, it was a Star Trek show. That's what that's mm-hmm. what the audience expected. And I think that the approach to the drama uh, was different. That that the sense of of exploration, uh, exploration, and and the uh, the joy and and the adventurism uh, was was kind of missing in the first couple of seasons. Uh, certainly in the fourth season, uh, with the addition of, of Manny Cotto mm-hmm. uh, as the showrunner, uh, brought back in some of that vitality and energy. But I felt that the show lacked that. Um, do you uh, initially? Now I wasn't. Did, did you, I wasn't producing. I, I I was only an episodic director, but that was my take on the did show. Did you watch the show? Because I mean, having looked at it again after all these years, I, and, and I'm not that familiar yet, Mark, with uh, the other shows, but I'm going to be. Um, <laughs> no, I, <laughs> trivia king is coming very <laughs> soon. The glove has been thrown down, yeah. sir. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to going back and seeing these other shows to see because I don't know what was missing so much in our first two seasons that people talk of. I'm I'm interested to see that. That's I mean, impression. I I sort of see that that our first two years had hallmarks of old Trek, um, but I don't. I honestly, I mean, I I can't really find the clunkers that everyone talks about. In those first I'm not years. talking about clunkers. I'm talking about uh, taking no prisoners. Uh, to compete with what was happening in t- television was going through a, a dramatic change at that point. It sure was. And I, think, was. I think Star Trek was resting on its laurels. It was right. trying to be something different than what the other Star Treks were. Mm. And my question to myself was, why? Why? It wasn't, it wasn't necessary to to mix up the formula that much. But to mm. me, to push the envelope even further, and I felt that they they backed off of uh, of the emotion and, the, and of the conflict. So you're it, saying they went uh, either too far or not far enough? Not far enough. Yeah. They, far didn't, enough. they didn't push the envelope there. Yeah. Um, That's they fascinating. Played it, I think they played it safe. Uh, well, I know. I, 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 I don't think they challenged... I don't think they challenged the material. You know, where's the beef? Yeah. I mean, I think Mr. Berman, God bless him, he'd had a track record and a hell of a track record of, of hits. And, you know, if it ain't that broke, don't fix it that much. And maybe that was a note that they might have. You know, well, also, I think that um, stepped over. I, I was told a story uh, years ago that um, our show was meant to be Seinfeld in space, where it was just kind of like, people reacting and responding to each other as opposed to uh, an element of what uh, carrying on the notion and message of the show itself. I and thought that there would be more interaction between the, the seven characters, uh, I, 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 you know, on the ship, well, uh, that we would be ER in space, that, you know, the ER the, yeah, would be replaced go. by a starship rather than a, an emergency room. Um, like that was the big show at the time. I mean, the ER was huge, wasn't it? Our third season was definitely a response to Kiefer Sutherland's show, 24, which was, was a new... I did that show. A new part of TV yeah. where we'd never seen uh, one episodic show have a, a through arc like that. The funny thing, I think, though, is that, um, you know, you've gone through that period of time for, what, 15, maybe now 20 years, and now you have a card. You've got all these different shows that... that, that just lay themselves flat as just Star Trek shows and they, they live on their own. Yeah. And, um, look, Star Trek is a brand that didn't live as a brand. No, when we were existing. No, not as a brand. It is now. I mean, definitely the, the, the French, the, the, that stamp of franchise has definitely been stamped. Yeah. For, but for pretty much everything that, and you know, I've got a tattoo. I won't tell you where, <laughs> Do you really? let me guess. Is it on your face, Connor? I have no tattoos. (laughs) All these years. (laughs) And I'm on your butt cheek. Um, (laughs) There's there's a couple. Um, So, I mean, I'm so intrigued to hear that you say that season three, we were going to be cut. And you know that from the sort of, you know, the inside track, do you? No, I I wasn't on the inside track. That's just what I had heard that. Oh. That this was going to be it. This was- I remember John Billingsley because I used to go to him because he was the sort of you know uh, uh, seasoned actor on our cast, other than Scott, who you know I couldn't very well knock on Scott's door and go. So what do you think, Scotty? Uh, but John was always like, yeah. John was after like season two. He yeah, thought he, we were done. He always thought we were we were close to being done then. 
Yeah, they needed the they needed the fourth season, and that's why they let it go for a hundred episodes. A pa- yes. To make yeah. a package out of yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and, 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 not, gonna, and these days, you don't even have to have that. You know, yeah. you it's, imagine? A whole, it's a whole different world. Why did they pass off the, the mantle to Manny? Was it just because Brannon and Rick had just done 17 years and they were exhausted? I, I have no idea. Why not? Yeah, I have no idea. And Manny showed such uh, flair and aplomb. At, uh, I will say this. I'm I, I, I want to ask you this, and I've wondered about this. Um, do you miss the experience? Of course. I I directed for <laughs> directed for 10 years. And it was the best 10 years of my life professionally. Right. Um, it was a joy to be on the set every single day. And it's so disheartening to, ha- to hear you say that, that you, it was going to be Seinfeld in space. Uh, to me, that's, exa- that's sort of how they portrayed the show to me when I, first, uh, when I directed my first episode, that this was going to be a gentler kind of, of Star Trek. It was, it was going to be a different one. And I, in my mind, I was wondering, why do that? You know, why... Keep pushing. And you talked about 24. 24, the, the, the visual excitement and the energy and the drive of right. that show, that's what, that's what you were competing against. Yes, it is. And right. yeah. I, I think that, that Star Trek dropped the ball on the Enterprise dropped the ball on that. I think you're right. I, think I mean, right. I, it's, it's a tough, I mean, you know, how many, 17, 16, 17 years, variation of a theme. It's, you know, it'll never be equaled again in TV history. It just, you know, it seems impossible now. Um, I mean, you have to take your hat off to to Rick and Brandon for achieving that. And, um, you know, sadly, we were the sort of you know, thin end of the stick, as it were. And I just want to back up, though, uh, maybe for a sense on this sort of um, note. Um, what got you into this? What got you involved in? In showbiz? Showbiz. Yeah. Um, I went to... Uh, University of Southern uh, University of California Santa Barbara my first year and I wanted to study political science huh? and my f- as a freshman I went to my first poli sci class and it was a girl no it, it, <laughs> it was it was it was the answers to the question that the professors were asking and the level of intelligence and response from all of my cohort uh, so, students so, so you didn't was, come f- blew, blew me away and I said, I can't compete with these people. I got to get into a business where I have a prayer. <laughs> really? And or I'm, I, or I'm smarter business. than well, them. No, no, not well, about well. smarter. No, it's not about smarter. It's about something that <laughs> that fits what I can do. Well, what were, and, you, what were you looking for? Um, well, I had always, always been interested in photography, and I loved movies. Uh, my father was indirectly involved in the business. Oh, yeah? And uh, I... my. My eyes were full of stars of Hollywood. You were a Southern Cal guy? You you born and bred around here? No, no, I grew up in Portland, Oregon, but my parents moved to Ah. L.A. in 60... What? Well, I'm from Kelso, Washington. Okay, well, close. That's close. Yeah. But in 62, we moved to uh, L.A., and I I left Santa Santa Barbara and went to USC and went to film school there. Right. Uh, And... Uh, influenced by the move that you came to, you know, movie town, as it were? I I always love movies. I remember... Uh, movies from uh, when I was right. a kid. So, question for you. Yeah. Your favorite three films. Favorite three? Yep. Um, uh, I'm a huge Hitchcock fan, so Vertigo, mm. I right. think, is a, nice. mas- is a masterpiece. Yeah. Um, uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Uh-huh. Oh. And the third one, I, I mean, I have so many. Some well, like it hot. Uh, so I love bi- anything that Billy Godfather. Wilder did. Godfather. I'm a huge fan of. The Godfather. Okay, uh, so David, your favorite director. Hitchcock. Yes. Oh, right. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah. I That's a, awesome. I had a dear friend, uh, Norman Lloyd, who just died last year. He was 106, and he was a good friend of Hitchcock's. And Norman would tell me his whole life uh, how it revolved around Hitchcock. So I got uh, through... Uh, one degree of separation got to know all these nice. great Hitchcock oh, stories. That's, amazing. that's awesome. Uh, Norman was the guy who fell off the uh, Statue of Liberty and Saboteur. Uh, which is, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, well. Uh, that's uh, awesome. Robert, Robert Cummings, uh, Norman played the uh, the Nazi spy Fry. And Robert, of course, um, Alfred, uh, sorry, uh, we call him Alfred at home. Uh, Hitchcock uh, well, di- he's, directed he's from Rear, your, your small He directed and, Rear yeah. Window on 18, of course. Yes. At Paramount, where, we sh- where was our standing sets were for Absolutely. the bridge. And that was a huge honor to, to work on that yeah, same terrific. set, same stage. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. They, so we have a new game uh, that we started playing. Um, You're on an island. And you are allowed three things. You're allowed uh, 
a group of music, whether it's, you know, a band or a, a musician a musician or a, a composer, you're allowed a literary artist, an author, and you're allowed dessert. And the dessert can be all of one dessert. And uh, so if it's, I don't want to say the dessert, but it, it, it can be all of one, you know. All cake, all ice cream. Sh- there you go. I didn't want to say that because now, you know, now you've put that in his head. <laughs> <laughs> but so who would your, who would your author be? Um, Michael Connolly. Oh yes. Oh really? Oh interesting. I, I love I love uh, how how he describes L A. Oh. I know every place that he talks about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I live near the Hollywood Station, um, so it's so much fun to visit all the places uh, in his novel that I that I know personally. I hear that. And I think his characters are are wonderful. Bosch um, and and the Lincoln lawyer and. They're they're just wonderful characters. Yeah, yeah they're great. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. They're just about I, to I, make. That's what I that's what I read all the time. It's your on. whole life, by the it, way. It is. You have. They're your, just about to make the Lincoln Lawyer for real, aren't they? Because they sort of they made well, they did the the you know, Matthew the, the white man's version of it. But yeah, I actually, thought it was terrific. It is good, but uh, I mean, obviously, it's a slight you know bastardization of the of the actual novel. So they get. I think I heard they're doing the TV show of it right now. Can't and then your composer as, or your. Ah, uh, the Beatles. Oh, the Beatles. Uh, That's his choice. Touche. Twenty-four-seven. Yeah. Yeah. My wife tells Look me I, I can't. I couldn't wear my Beatles. Uh, always no question. Always no question. N- never. It, music died in '69. Oh wow. Oh my oh. word. A diehard. Wow. Did you watch the uh, the Jackson stuff just recently? Uh, yeah. Did you watch? I watched it that weekend. All, the, all eight hours. What's your pudding? What's your dessert for the I island? Have, I have an apple every night. Ah. <laughs> Ah, what's, so, what's so funny? Mean, there's apple. nothing wrong. I mean, apple, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm vegan and I don't eat other kinds. Yeah. Of, I mean, I, I, I cherish my apple every night. It's I Good can't for wait for it. Do you I, put a cinnamon just, on I, it? I, I just want to say no, no but, cinnamon. No just, cinnamon. This yeah. is this is for the rest of your life. And yeah. you get an apple. Yeah. Okay. That's simple. That, that's what's, uh, what time of night? Why is that? That's been that, a delicious. No, no. Be some it's, kind it's, of it's not a question. It's it's cosmic crisp. For anybody who doesn't know apples. Do you like Cosmic Crisp? I, Organic Cosmic Crisp, I think. Well, I don't want to pay the extra buck. But yeah. <laughs> oh, you're, oh, you're, okay. I don't, so, I don't, so what do I need organic extra... for? I mean, it's not necessary. But if they, if I can't get the regular, then my wife gets the Cosmics. What time of I mean, night do you, do you have the apple? 7.30. They're, quite, they're filling. 7.30. Is that, that's after supper? You've had your supper? Yes. And then well, it's part of right. my supper. It is. It's, it's your dessert for supper. Is that an English supper. term, supper? Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 Dinner for Dinner. us. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Dinner for tra- us. Got to translate. Yeah. It's a Minnesota uh, thing, too. Yeah. Depending on your oh. class, <laughs> depending on your structure in the class in England, you either have tea, that's working class, at about 5.30, quarter to 6. <laughs> well, I have tea every and night then, as well. And, and no, then. that's a different tea. That's, uh, that's Tea is like, I'm having me tea. That's like, that's your evening meal. Uh, the, the chattering classes will have supper, mm-hmm. that's the middle classes, and then the posh folk have dinner. Really? Yeah, pretty much. Dinner, okay. Yeah. Because yeah. dinner is served. And dinner is usually in a black tie and tuck still. Mm. To this. No, I'm kidding. Oh, my God. <laughs> So, uh, but I, good for you. I, uh, I have taken to eating more fruit lately myself, and I, that has become my um, after lunch and supper uh, treat rather than cookies and, you know, other sweetie. I'm trying to avoid the, the, the sugar and the inflammation. It's, uh, it plays out in the end. Is it, do you feel pretty damn good being vegan? And, uh, you look amazing. Bro. I am. I, I'm shocked every time I look in the mirror. Are you are you like a hundred and three? What are you now? I, right. I'm seventy. I'm seventy two. <laughs> you look seventy two. A bless and me. I don't. I feel sixteen. Good for you. you. Oh, wow. wow. Well, David, um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the, the Shuttle Pod Show. It really oh, is. Oh, nice. Porthos. It's Porthos, awesome. I've missed you, Porthos. You can pick him up. He doesn't bite. Yeah, yeah, this one doesn't bite. <laughs> I kept, you know, this this just came out of a box in the garage. Really? Yeah. Oh, I, you used to get the. Uh, I see all the all the junk as it were. I, yeah, if yeah. I had kept all that, I'd have my own island in the. Oh yeah. God, you would. But yeah. I, I gave it all away to my nephews you did. and. Yeah. Did you? Yeah, my son and I had. I used to get uh, the marketing boxes when I was a producer. They'd send out one every every uh, month or so. Right. I mean, huge boxes full yeah. of all this stuff. stuff. And if I had kept it in the plastic wrap and went on eBay today, yeah, 
Oh, I'd you'd... be a rich man. You wouldn't be sitting here. I would not be. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Here in the shuttle board. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. It's great to see thank you. Thank you. It's great and, to see uh, both of you. It's, yeah. it's Thank you so much for thrill. coming to visit us. It's, You're welcome. Uh, yeah. Thank wonderful. you for the invite. Thank yeah. you, brother. We'll see yeah. you in Las Vegas maybe yeah. this year. I don't know. I got to get an invite. Give we'll me an invite. See. Oh, we're you can come with us. You're coming with. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. But anyway. Thank you so hey, thank much. Thank you. You got yeah. it. That was fun. Thank you so much.